Hi, everyone. On behalf of Syscript and the planning team, welcome to Aware for All Midwest. My name is Phyllis Kaplan. I am the Senior Manager of Events and Community Engagement at Syscript. Syscript, or the Center for Information and Study on Clinical Research Participation, is a nonprofit organization that educates the public about clinical research. We do not conduct trials or recruit for trials, but we believe that everyone should have the information they need to be informed about clinical research. To make sure that this program is a meaningful educational experience for you, we ask for your feedback. We will have seven poll questions pop up on your screen throughout the program. Answering these questions will serve as raffle entries. Let's start with an easy question to test out the poll feature. I am participating in the webinar as a member of an exhibiting organization, a professional involved or associated with clinical research, or general public or caregiver interested in learning more about clinical research. You'll have 30 seconds to answer each poll question that pops up throughout the program. If you have any questions throughout the event, please shoot us a message in the Q&A box. Our team will be monitoring the chat and will bring up any questions you may have during the program. Our ability to live long, healthy lives is due in a large part to advances in medical treatments, advances that would not have been possible without the participation of volunteers in clinical trials. I also want to take a moment to acknowledge any of our audience members who have participated in clinical research. We thank you for your important contribution to advance medical science and health for all of us. Syscript was honored to collaborate on this important program with many community and research organizations. These groups help to spread the word about the AWARE program. You can visit many of these organizations in our informational exhibit center by clicking the link in the resource tab or by clicking either of the banner images on your screen. You can revisit the informational exhibit center whenever you'd like. When you visit, be sure to keep an eye out for two special scavenger hunt kiosks. If you find both of these before July 29th at 5 p.m. Eastern time, you'll be entered into a special raffle. Now I would like to recognize our planning team. For the past few months, these dedicated individuals have helped organize today's virtual event. Without your help and support, this program would not have been possible. We would also like to thank our generous Aware for All sponsors, all of whom contributed funds and support to make this program free and accessible to all. A very special thank you to the Aware Industry Consortium, Biogen, CSL Bearing, AMD Serono, Genentech, IQVIA, Janssen, Novartis, Otsuka, Pfizer, and WCG for providing support to bring this educational program to five regions this year. To our national and local sponsors and to our in-kind outreach supporters and exhibitors. Thank you all for your continued support. In just a moment, I will turn it over to Steve Satak, who will provide an overview of clinical research. After that, we will host a panel discussion with study volunteers and research professionals sharing information about their roles in the clinical research process. We encourage you to send in questions through the Q&A box or by emailing awareforall at syscript.org. After that, we'll have a quick seated chair stretch provided by Anita. Finally, we will conclude with our medical hero ceremony and host a raffle. Let's get started. To follow along with the presentation, you can download the digital handbook from our resource center in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. You will also receive a link to download the handbook after the event. Poll question number one should have just popped up on your screens. How would you rate your knowledge of clinical research? You will have 30 seconds to answer. Again, the question is, how would you rate your knowledge of clinical research? Don't forget that by answering these questions, your name will be entered into a raffle at the end of the program.
Are you open? Yes, we are. Welcome to the MT Pharmacy. There's nothing on the shelves because we wanted to show what modern medicine would be like without clinical trials. Hi, my name is Lester, and since I can remember, my mother had, well, she has diabetes, and she's been fighting it for years. Clinical trials are medical research studies involving patients. They can help discover new medicines or get improved versions of existing medicines. My brother was diagnosed with appendix cancer at the age of 46. The type of tumor that he has is called a signet ring cell carcinoma. I think there's only like a very small percentage of people in the United States that have survived from it. So um, that type of cancer, I would really love for there to be a cure for. They help us find out if a treatment can work in patients. We'd like to fill these shelves a bit like how clinical trials fill the shelves in a regular pharmacy. For Teddy. I wrote on my box, um, addiction. I wrote it for family and friends, and it's good to get the awareness out because a lot of people don't take addiction seriously. I use seven boxes because I put down pills for different reasons. You know, I use HIV and AIDS because that's been out here for a long time. I picked cancer for my box because my mother was a victim of cancer. She died of the year 2008. I was the age of nine years old. I never really thought about clinical trials. I guess I just thought it was for people who had cancer or something serious like that. I didn't realize everything needed to be tested. I think this is a good concept. I think it gets people talking. The store is a great idea. I've actually never thought about the fact that without clinical trials, we wouldn't have any of the medicines that we take every single day. It is my pleasure to welcome Steve Satek, founder and president of Great Lakes Clinical Trials. Welcome to Aware for All Midwest. We're thrilled that so many of you are joining us to learn more about clinical research. This program is brought to you by CISCRIP, the Center for Information and Study and Clinical Research Participation, with the support from local organizations. My name is Steve Satek. I am the president and founder of Great Lakes Clinical Trials. Um, we're a research center headquartered on the north side of Chicago with five additional locations throughout the region. Uh, we've been a proud sponsor and, and supporter of uh, CISCRIP since the company um, was founded. Um, and I've personally been involved in clinical trials for over 30 years. Um, and I've worked in major hospitals, private doctor's offices, and dedicated research centers throughout the United States and actually Europe and Asia as well. Our goal here today is to help you understand the clinical research process, including the risks and benefits of participating. So have you ever taken an allergy medication or a pain reliever? If so, you can thank clinical research participants. It could have been five, 10, or even 20 years ago that thousands of individuals participated in the research studies that led the way to these medications being readily, readily available to you today. Around the world, people are living longer, healthier lives because of selfless individuals who take part in clinical research studies. These trials help find ways to prevent, treat, and even cure certain medical conditions. We like to call the participants medical heroes. At Syscript, we believe study volunteers are important partners in the research process. That's why our motto is education before participation. Partnerships work best when everyone understands the overall goal, what may be expected of them, and how they are protected throughout the process. This includes clinical researchers too. The information that medical experts learn from clinical trials improves public health and can even save lives. And it all starts with these questions. How does a disease progress and how can it be prevented? How well does a new drug work or not work? Is there a better way to treat a disease? Does where people live affect their health? Researchers can only answer these questions with the help of clinical re research participants. 
A clinical trial is a carefully designed study in which a participant may be asked to take a new drug or treatment so that researchers can answer a specific medical question. These questions are like, is a treatment safe? Does it improve a certain medical condition? Does it have side effects? How much should people take? Is it any better than medications that are already available on the market? Because researchers are studying new treatments, there may be risk to participants in a clinical trial. However, something valuable is always learned from clinical research studies that improve public health and can potentially lead to game-changing treatments. It is important to understand that being in a clinical trial is not the same thing as going to your doctor for care. When you go to your doctor, they'll give you a treatment that has already been tested and approved by the government. This is called routine or standard of care. I like to think of it this way. When you go to your doctor because of an illness, he or she has a flexible and wide range of options to offer, including a choice of many different medications that are already approved for the illness, or even exercise or physical therapy or those sorts of things. In a clinical trial, the options are limited to a more targeted question. And, and we're looking for the answer to that question as we talked about in the previous slide. Now, you can't really understand something by studying just one group of people. Gender, age, and ethnicity all affect the way people respond to diseases and treatments. For example, Alzheimer's disease happens twice as often in women than in men. Type 2 diabetes and asthma are more common in people who are Black or of African descent. And Hispanics, Asians, and white women are more likely to develop osteoporosis. For many years, clinical trials included only white men. This meant that the information collected in those trials was not complete and could not tell us how treatments affected other groups. But today, clinical trials welcome the participation of all people, and they are closely monitored for their safe and ethical treatment. Today, health professionals are more aware than ever of the need to have diverse populations in clinical research. As a community, we are taking steps to break down participation barriers, improve diversity, and pave the way to a healthier future for everyone. Several studies have shown that underrepresented minority populations consistently demonstrate a high willingness to participate in clinical research studies. Individuals within these communities have said that a lack of access to clinical trials is the primary reason why they don't participate. This includes outreach and communications that have failed to reach them, health and research professionals not asking them to participate, clinical trials that are simply too far away, and participation requ requirements that are too difficult to follow. You may remember past abuses like the Tuskegee syphilis study between 1932 and 1972, in which treatment was withheld from black men for many years. Or the story of Henrietta Lacks and what is now known as the HeLa cells, one of the most commonly used cell lines in scientific research. These studies were performed without proper consent of the participants and they were not compensated. Today, federal guidelines and ethical practices are in place to monitor the safety and to protect the rights of participants. If we work together, we can solve these problems and make clinical trials far more accessible. Now let's talk a little bit about how clinical trials move forward and how long it takes to advance a new treatment. This is all part of a four phase process. Clinical trials begin with a small number of participants in phase one. The goal of this is to learn more about how safe a new treatment is. Next, in phases two and three, clinical trials recruit larger numbers of participants to test how well the treatment works and help researchers learn more about its safety. This part could take several years. After phase three, the new medications are reviewed by the FDA for possible approval. Researchers then continue to study treatments in phase four after they've been approved. These trials usually involve large numbers of participants. In these trials, researchers look at real world experiences and check to see if treatments work well over a long period of time. So you've probably heard a lot about the new, in the news lately about the development of vaccines and treatments for COVID-19. Vaccines and treatments for infectious disease usually take nine or 10 years to develop. This seems like a long time, but it's necessary for understanding if a treatment is safe and effective at specific dose levels. 
However, the clinical trial process for COVID-19 treatments and vaccines is moving at a faster pace and may produce promising therapies in only a few years. Some treatments of vaccines have had a head start because they are based on research that was conducted for viruses that are very similar to the COVID-19 virus. The pandemic has mobilized much higher levels of coordination between companies and government agencies, which helped to speed up the process. So clinical trials can be sponsored by the government, academic medical centers, pharmaceutical companies, biotechnology companies, or even medical device companies. In addition, we also see a lot of food and nutrition companies involved in clinical research, whereby health claims can be made for certain food groups or nutritional supplements. Now, clinical trial research requires many different people, each of whom is critical to the process. Like members of a sports team, clinical trials have coaches, players, and referees, and each person has an important role to play. The principal investigator, or PI, is like the head coach of a team. They are responsible for organizing and leading the trial, as well as recording and analyzing the data. Like a head coach, the PI follows a playbook, which is called the trial protocol. The protocol is a set of instructions that everyone on the team must follow. Now, the research staff members are like assistant coaches who help the PI. Specifically, the clinical research coordinator handles the day-to-day -day activities at the research site. They're like a project manager. They work closely with the PI and are the main point of contact for clinical trial participants. Organizations that help protect the safety of participants are the referees. The referees make sure teams follow the rules, review the trial before it starts, and keep participants safe. The number and type of referees involved in a trial depends on the research being conducted. Now, every trial is reviewed, approved, and supervised by an independent ethics committee. This committee, known as the Institutional Review Board, or IRB, makes sure a trial is ethical and fair, and that there is not too much risk for clinical trial participants. During the trial, researchers must let the IRB know if there are any changes in the trial plan, or if participants experience serious injuries or side effects. The ethics committee will end the trial if it feels participants are simply not safe. Now, referees from the federal government are also involved. Agencies like the FDA or the European Medicines Agency review trials, inspect research centers, and monitor research groups to make sure they are following federal guidelines. These agencies have the final say in whether a treatment is, is or is not finally approved. Now let's talk about the most important members of the team, the clinical trial participants. Participants are like the players on the field. Without them, clinical research cannot happen. We need all different types of people to participate in the research process. Research can include sick or healthy participants. It all depends on what is outlined in the playbook or the protocol. Now your friends or family can be your fans or support system while you're party, taking part in a clinical trial. They can help you come up with questions to ask your doctor, but in the end, it's your job to make the final decision if you will be willing to participate in the trial. Now, everyone has had the chance to participate in research. You just have to find the clinical trial that is right for you. Just like in sports, clinical trials have eligibility criteria. These are guidelines that indicate who can or cannot be part of the trial. Eligibility criteria ensure that the clinical trial is studying the right people under the right conditions. If you are considering a clinical trial, be honest with the researchers about your health. Lying or hiding information to get into a trial could endanger your safety and harm the research. Okay, so let's assume the coaches say that you're eligible to play. The next question you have to ask yourself is, do I choose to play? You cannot say whether or not you want to participate without understanding the rules of the game. What are your responsibilities as a player? How long will the game last? What are the risks and benefits of playing? The informed consent process is designed to answer all of these questions and is required by the FDA and its ethics committees or IRB. The informed consent is one of the most important parts of research and it's a term 
you're going to hear a lot about. Remember that informed consent is an ongoing process through the trial, not just a single event at the beginning. If you decide you are interested in participating in a clinical trial, the trial staff will go through the informed consent form with you and answer any questions. Before you participate in a trial, you must read, understand, and sign the informed consent form. It's important to note that you don't have to review the informed consent form in English if there's another language that you prefer to speak. So if you participate in a clinical trial, you have rights. First of all, you have the right to understand the purpose, benefits, risks, and side effects of the clinical trial. You have the right to answer, ask questions and discuss your concerns. It's very important for participants to ask questions until they fully understand the trial and what their participation really means. Most importantly, you have a right to quit the trial at any time and for any reason. The research staff will help you do this safely. Now, deciding to take part in a clinical trial is a personal decision. What's right for you might not be right for someone else. Researchers set up their studies so their trial will be fair. They also want the research to be accurate and unbiased. They don't want their ideas about what they think they should have happen in a trial influence the results. So to set up fair trials, participants may be randomly split into different trial groups. In this case, the researcher and the participants do not get to decide which research group the participants will be in. This is called a randomized trial. It's done by like the flip of a coin. Now, sometimes participants do not know which treatment they are receiving. When the participants or researchers in a clinical study both do not know which treatment the participant gets, it's called blinding. In some trials, researchers will use what's called a placebo. A placebo looks like a trial treatment but it does not have any medication or medicine in it. Sometimes the placebo is in the form of a drug is referred to as a sugar pill. What's interesting is that even though a placebo has no medicine in it, there are times when people who are taking a placebo improve or feel better during a trial. This is what we call the placebo effect. Now deciding to participate in a clinical trial is a personal decision. Here are some reasons why you might consider getting involved in clinical trials. First of all, you might get access to new treatments that are not publicly available. You also might help to advance science and to help others who have the same condition as you. You also can receive free and close healthcare monitoring, oftentimes much closer than you get from going to your regular doctor for standard of care treatment. Some, but not all of clinical trials will pay for travel costs and for time and commitment. The amounts vary widely. These benefits are in addition to the help you will provide for health research. Now, of course, research involves risks. There could be physical risks. Um, a sick participant, for example, might not get better. They may feel uncomfortable or their symptoms might get worse. There's also an emotional risk. The trial can be demanding and participation might be stressful. Financially, there might be out-of-pocket expenses such as childcare or missing work. And when you agree to participate in research, you are giving permission for researchers to collect information about you. Other things to consider, you know, participating in clinical trials takes time and effort. There's a commitment involved. You can work with the trial, st trial staff to try and accommodate your schedule. The trial might end early. Even if you want to continue to participate, the doctor, the referees, or the company making the drug might even stop the trial at any time. Unfortunately, many participants drop out of studies because they don't fully understand what they are signing up for. Here are some tips if you are in a trial. First of all, do your homework. You know, Read all the information provided to you by the clinical trial staff. You could even go online and learn more about potential treatments being studied. Take your time. There's absolutely nothing wrong with asking a researcher to slow down. Ask questions. Bring up any concerns with the trial staff, your doctor, or your family and friends. 
you know, many people even bring a family member or a friend with them to the doctor visits so they can ask questions as well. Remember, they're your fans and they're your supporters. So there are a lot of things to consider when you decide to participate in a clinical trial. Today's presentation is an important first step. Now it's up to you to learn more about clinical trials. The best place to start is with your doctor. You can also get information from local research centers, you know, visiting their website or even giving them a call. You can also go to disease advocacy groups or to clinical trial conferences. Um, you can also learn more information at Syscript Ruth back in the Information Exhibit Center. On this slide, we are providing a few web um, links that you can go to that will give you some information about clinical trials that are currently ongoing in the United States right now and across the world. Now, clinical research participants are truly medical heroes without whom medical science cannot move forward. On behalf of all of us at Syscript, thanks to the million of millions of people who give the gift of participation in clinical trials each year and to the rest of us who admire them for doing so. We appreciate you taking the time today to learn about the clinical research process, and we strongly encourage you to share what you've learned with your family, friends, and people throughout your community. Thank you. Thank you so much, Steve. We've been receiving some great questions from our audience, and one that I'd love to ask you is how do you determine if a clinical trial is right for you? Do you have any advice that you would like to share to somebody who is considering getting involved with a clinical trial, but not quite sure if they should? Absolutely. You know, it's it's a it's a great question, but it's a very difficult question to answer. Um, people who are out there in the community are are so different. There's individuals who might have a life threatening disease, and there's very little treatments available out there for them. So they're more apt to look for a clinical trial and as, as a resource for getting a treatment that's not currently available. Individuals who have a disease area that have a lot of medications that are currently available um, might just go to their doctor and be well treated by, by those available medications. So a clinical trial might not be as important for them. Um, so it's really, as we talked about in the presentation, it's a personal decision, um, but anybody who wants to get involved in a clinical trial should consider a few things. One, you wanna consider the time commitment and the commitment that you can make to the clinical trial process. Um, and then if, if you do feel that you can make that commitment, talk to your doctor and then talk to the doctor who's leading up the research program and determine that, that the fit is right for you. Um, as we talked about, there's this uh, the informed consent process, and that's a process where you're asking a lot of questions about whether the project's right for you, understanding the healthcare risks and benefits, and if everything kind of gels and it feels right for you, that's when you should make the step to, to join the clinical trial. Now, there's a lot of times you might find out that the, the, the project doesn't feel right. There's something wrong with the, the process. That's when you ask the questions to the, um, the, the clinical trial team and see if they can answer those questions to, to the, the best of their ability. And, and potentially your, your question will be resolved and you decide to join the trial or it actually can actually answer the question and then a clinical trial might not be right for you. So the, the big picture here is ask questions, communicate with your doctor, communicate with the clinical trial team to find out if it's right for you. Thank you again, Steve. We appreciate your providing a foundation of information about clinical research. You're welcome. I just want to encourage everyone again to share any questions with us through the Q&A box or by emailing awareforall at syscript.org. We'll keep collecting questions as they are coming through. Here we have poll question number two. Have you ever participated in a clinical trial? Thank you for answering. Poll question number three is now on your screens and we're testing your knowledge after Steve's presentation. True or false? Responses to medicines can vary depending on several factors, including someone's genetic background, ethnicity, sex, and lifestyle. That is why scientists need to have diverse representation in clinical trials.
We are going to follow that up with question number four. True or false, an institutional review board's role is to make sure that the study is ethical and the rights and welfare of participants are protected. We hope everybody was able to answer those questions with ease. As we move on to our panel portion of the program, I want to remind everyone of our Q&A feature. It's a great way to interact with our speakers and ask them any questions you may have about clinical research. I would like to welcome our panelists and Jasmine Benger, Associate Director of Research Services at Syscript, who will be moderating our panel discussion. Hi, everyone, and welcome. Uh, my name is Jasmine Benger. I'm the Associate Director for the Research Services team here at Syscript. Um, and it's a pleasure to be able to speak to you all today. We have a, a wonderful group today. Um, it's a great mix of people who have either participated themselves in clinical trials or they had a loved one participate and they helped to support them during that time. Or we also have people that are involved in actually conducting research. So it's a really nice group, a lot of different perspectives. Um, I wanted to begin just by maybe we could start with a quick round of introductions. Um, and maybe I'll, I'll turn it over. Um, Naya, do you want to start? Sure. Um, my name is Naya Grant. I li lived with diabetes for since 2007. Um, so that's what, 17, 18 years. I apologize for the background noise. I think that's my cat, um, Wonton getting into something he's not supposed to, but that's all right. Um, I, that's the question, um, how did I hear about the clinical trial that I was in? Yeah. Um, I participated in another trial um, at the University of Virginia in Charlottesville and they kept me on their list and another trial came up um, and they asked me if I would participate again and I said yes. Um, and so one thing that I find very important is um, participation in clinical trials needs to have people who look like me. Um, I'm brown, I'm female, I am queer. And so if you don't have data points that look like me, how are you going to realistically get an idea of whether or not this is going to work across a broad section of the population? So that is why I um, raise my hand and, and volunteer to, to help with science. Wonderful. And how did you mind me asking how you found out about your research opportunity about the clinical trial? Word of mouth. A friend of mine said, hey, I heard about this trial. Um, I'm not eligible to participate. Is this something you might be interested in? And I said, yeah, sure, why not? <laughs> Great. Well, thanks for being here. And then we'll certainly talk a little bit more about the importance of diversity in clinical trials in a moment. Um, Lynn, I'll, I'll turn it to you. Would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, my name is Lynn Jordan. And I found out about the trial because um, uh, a a pretty good friend of mine owns the company that is that ran this tr particular trial, and um, he knew about my um, my history. I mean, I have a lot of comorbidities. I I have comorbid or whatever the word is. <laughs> I have diabetes, hypertension, and I'm obese. It was like a jackpot. So when um, he asked me if I would be interested, um, I I was like, sure, of course. I wanted to be involved in history so to speak. So, um, and what was the and I, trial for Lynn? Oh, I'm sorry. It was for, um, COVID the Johnson vaccine. Mm -hmm. Sorry. I just, I'm, I don't know. No, I was thinking okay. I okay. thought, this isn't the vaccine panel. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> so that's what the trial was for. And I was, I mean, it had been going on and the whole thing had affected my life so much because I'm an entertainer. So mm -hmm. I was like, sure, I'll help, I'll help them find a vaccine <laughs> pronto. And because um, of my own um, physical, you know, my health and how it was a dangerous thing for me. So mm -hmm. if I caught it, I would probably have a bad go of it. So I was, um, you know, enthusiastic about right. getting involved. Wonderful. Well, um, thank you for, for sharing that. And, and uh, Dory, do you want to share uh, a little bit about yourself and your experience with clinical research? I'm so sure. My name is uh, Dory Rivera. First, thank you for inviting me to be on this panel. So um, happy to be here. A little bit about myself. I actually um, learned about a clinical trial for my daughter 17 years ago, and she's 17 now. So she was almost, she was one 
when she first uh, started with the clinical trial. And I learned about it like a lot of families do through other parents. So that's been um, my experience. And even post that, since we've enrolled in other clinical trials post the first one we did, and it's always been through, like somebody else said, Lynn, I think it was you, word of mouth. Um, so um, it was word of mouth that I heard about the clinical trial. And I decided to join because it was one of those, uh, it was that or hopelessness. It was, it was what we were at the end of our, of our first year of, of life with my daughter. And we had seen 22 different specialists and had gone to countless doctors everywhere from uh, Chicago land, which has some of the best in the world to Mexico. We were kind of out of options. So uh, we, we figured uh, we trusted other parents' experiences with clinical trials and we decided to, to, um, to, to do the same. So, you know, um, you know, there's highs and lows. I don't know if you're gonna ask us or I can, you know, go into that. No, you can share. More. Sure. So I think that the highs were, it was hope. I think that was one of the definite highs of participating in a clinical trial was it gave us some sense of hope. And the low was just the complexity of it. I just remember being overwhelmed with paperwork and consents and um, it, it was just a lot for me to understand at the time. And I, I wish somebody would have broken it down a little bit more. And, you know, we kind of went in and went right to the clinical trial. I wish we would have like maybe gotten assigned a caseworker or social worker. We had a nurse and she was great, but she was still a nurse. So her mind was always in the, in the medical term world. And I was like, I'm just a mom trying to save her daughter's life. Um, so I think the low of it at the beginning was just the overwhelming um, you know, paperwork that we had to find uh, what it really meant for us to be in a clinical trial. You know, we just kind of signed and signed and signed not knowing exactly what it was. Uh, learned a lot since then. And so that, um, that's probably the low and also what surprised me a little bit. So I think the, that was it. But overall, really good experience. Um, I echo, you know, um, my colleague here, uh, Nia's sentiments on uh, the importance of it, just the diversity of it is really, is really important. And that's why I'm here just to talk about my experience as a person of color as well. Wonderful. Well, thank you, um, Lynn, Dory, and, and Naya for your, you know, your participation. You've definitely helped contribute to, you know, the advancements of, of new therapy. So thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to turn it now to um, introduce some of the people that are, are actively involved in clinical research in different ways. And um, maybe Holly, do you want to start us off? Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Jasmine. My, um, my name is Holly Milliger. I'm the uh, research program manager for lupus research with Dr. Ramsey Goldman at Northwestern University here in downtown Chicago. And so we specifically work with, with lupus research and we have several clinical trials um, going right now. So my role is to make sure everything is moving forward. So I have a lot of correspondence with the with the sponsors and NIH and reports and regulatory items, um, manage the coordinator staff, make sure everything is running smoothly there, um, as well as a lot of correspondence with the patients and recruitment. So um, have a lot of, um, you know, a lot of widespread um, involvement here. And actually one of our research, uh, one of our recent projects was a focus group training project where we had different um, public op opinion leaders from the community in Chicago that we had focus groups with and held trainings on participation in clinical trials so that they could then go into their community and spread some information um, on what it means to participate in a clinical trial and what are the barriers and facilitators to participating and you know covering racism in clinical trials um, so that was one of our one of our recent projects because we realized that having people having representatives from the communities was really probably the best way to spread information about participation. Absolutely. So well, thank, thank you. you for being here. Yeah, thank you for having me. Excellent. Um, Dr. Jane, would you like to go next? Yeah, hi there. Uh, Manish Jane, I'm a Chicago-based rheumatologist um, 
And so I've been involved in clinical trials, um, kind of in rheumatic diseases, not really lupus as much more, you know, rheumatoid arthritis and, and the, kind of some other autoimmune conditions um, for the last five years. And then for the last year or so have been um, pretty involved in COVID-19 uh, clinical trial uh, work as well. Been looking at a number of different treatments at different phases of the disease, including um, vaccine studies as well. So it was a lot of fun to hear about some of your guys' experiences in that vaccine space. Um, and I'm actually recognizing one of the other physicians on the panel, Dr. Loke. I actually trained at the University of uh, Michigan, and you were my uh, attending when I was a resident uh, on rounds. So it's really nice to, to see some familiar faces. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you. Small world. <laughs> Dr. Dr. Lowe, would you like to go next? Introduce yourself. Yeah, so um, I um, didn't remember that, um, but um, we have so many residents and fellows. So I'm Anna Locke and I'm at University of Michigan. I am a hepatologist. I've been um, involved in clinical research and clinical trials for four decades. I always said I start at the age of um, five. Um, and um, so most of my um, early research was in hepatitis B and then in hepatitis C. Uh, and now we cure hepatitis C. Um, I have to find other things to do. Uh, so we also get involved in uh, fatty liver disease, which is becoming most common uh, in liver cancer. And most recently also got involved in COVID vaccine trials as well. Um, because um, I've been um, involved in research for so long, I've also become the assistant dean for clinical research, um, really providing the infrastructure support and uh, mentoring uh, for young faculty. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, thank you all for, for being here. Um, I know we've already, you know, the topic of diversity in clinical trials has come up already, and I'd really like to, um, for the audience to help understand why is diversity in clinical research so important to make sure that you know the new development or that medicines and, and therapies that are being developed are safe and effective for everybody. Um, Holly, do you want to maybe uh, start by sharing a little bit about your experience? Sure, about the uh, importance of diversity. You know, aside from the the you know that that the obvious importance of you know having having all community groups equally represented. Um, you know, just to make sure that, you know, everyone's included and everyone's, you know, represented. But I think that there's also uh, a reason for just physiologically, you know, different, different races can respond differently to, you know, different, different treatments and different medicines. And I think that that might be something that can be, you know, kind of overlooked. And so, you know, pe people in the people in minorities, I think that they're, that they're, you know, often often left out of, you know, participation in this. And then I think that some of those reasons are just, um, you know, I think that they're just kind of overlooked and I think we just kind of keep going forward and forward. Um, but, you know, aside from just, you know, having having equal representation, I think that the, the physiological reasons are important as well. From a science standpoint, sure. Anyone else want to go off of what Holly said about, you know, why it's so important? Well, women and men react differently to things as well. So if your entire sample population is male and the drug is for females, then that is going to, that's not going to read well. Absolutely. Yeah, and I, I know. Oh, go, go ahead, Dory. Oh, I was just going to say the difference in um, between people can lead to different responses for the same medication. A lot takes into it. So it could be age, uh, genetics. Uh, weight, definitely what we're talking about, ethnic origin, even sometimes geographic location. Um, I think there was a time when drug studies, as I've read and learned over the years, was predominantly white male. And it really left some unanswered questions for what happens to other people with the same, with the same uh, conditions. So safety and efficacy um, should, be test, should be tested on all, not just uh, not just the, the privileged few. Um, so I think uh, people of, of ethnic or racial backgrounds that are different, just in a, even an effort to address um, lack, of, lack of adequate um, support for upcoming therapies, and then uh, more trust in the community as well. If uh, the community doesn't know that this is something that's taking place, they're less apt to trust it just because they've never really 
um, had a family member who's gone through it or or known someone. I know somebody who I who had who has a very severe form of cancer. I I researched a clinical trial for her and uh, she wasn't supposed to live until December and it's June and she's doing great on this mm -hmm. trial. So it's it's important. Absolutely. Uh, Dr. Loker or Dr. Jane, do you have anything to add to, to that? I agree with all the things that have been said. Um, so in addition to um, differences in response, you can also have differences in side effects because if the drug is metabolized differently, um, people can respond differently. But also the disease itself can be different because sometimes the disease progresses more quickly in certain age group or in certain race or in certain um, gender. Um, and um, so you have to um, have um, people with um, that represent the community. Otherwise, when you have um, the results of the trial, you don't know whether it applies to everyone or whether it only applies to the people who happen to be in a trial. Well said. Yeah. The only thing I'd add, just as a clinician, I'm constantly bringing clinical trial data into my practice to help kind of make informed medical decisions with my patients. And when I'm evaluating, you know, maybe it's a new drug or maybe it's an old drug for a new indication, I want to make sure that trial population is matches the patient in front of me as much as possible. And so, you know, yeah, we see patients of varying ethnic backgrounds uh, with a lot of diversity. And so it's just important that those trials represent the patients that we're caring for. Absolutely. I've, I've found um, a lot of African-Americans because I was trying, I have a band, 10 pieces and um, eight of the um they're all male except for me but eight of them are african-american men and of the you know the eight because there was a shortage of african-americans for the study and of the eight that i asked only one of them said yes the rest of them were like trial nah you know they they had no interest and i was like well this is you know you're making history this will help and they were just like they didn't trust it I don't, you know, I heard the Tuskegee Airmen <laughs> mentioned okay. quite a bit, <laughs> you know, there was a lot of uh, distrust. Sure. So sure. much that I thought maybe I was nuts. I was like, why am I so eager? <laughs> and that was, and I reached out to a lot of, uh, a, lo a lot of women as well, though, you know, it was just my band. I, their response was so strong mm. and every mm. single, per every single person I asked, except for one said no way basically like what are you doing you know and i thought oh boy that's yeah, how are, how are they how that's that's a challenge how are they dealing with this it is and i think it, you know you bring up a lot of a very important point because you know there were um historical events that took place that you know where people weren't treated ethically um you know and but we've come a long way since then to make sure that you know people are protected that participate in clinical research and that they understand exactly what they're signing up for um so I, i'm wondering you know that's just such an important point what are some other um you know barriers maybe that you see you all see in your opinion um as you know making it even more difficult for people um to participate in clinical trials and to make sure that clinical trials are, are really diverse and representative i think Location for one. So I live in Baltimore. I was going to say. <laughs> um, and the trials that I participate in are in Virginia. So it's a three hour ride one way. And I, I make the effort and rearrange my schedule in my day because, again, representation is super important to me. And if I'm the one that stands up and then checks the box, then, then so be it. I'll do it. But not everyone has that luxury. Not everyone has, has the car or the time or the flex or the schedule to be able to do that. Um, so I think one of the things that I would like to see more with clinical trials is them being more in areas where the people already live. So if it's a, just walk down to, or if it's, you know, oh, we're, you know, we're meeting at your church on Tuesday. Well, everybody knows where church is. And if you go regularly, then you've got a, a system and a ride and, and something. Um, as opposed to having to trek two, three hours on public transportation or, or something something along those lines. Access is so important for sure. And there's a, you know, later, later on, I want to ask a few questions about how technology maybe is able to, to help with, um, with bridging that gap. But anyone else have any thoughts on different barriers that are, you know, in place right now? 
I think even a step before location, which is so important, Nia, is finding the clinical trial itself. Like not the location, but how people find out about clinical trials. Mm-hmm. You know, you go on clinicaltrials.gov, you put in COVID and there's 6,000 links. You know, mm-hmm. um, I think that is a huge barrier um, to finding it. And even before finding the clinical trial, what is a clinical trial? I know in my community, in the Brown and you know the Hispanic and Mexican American community, which is predominant here in the Chicago area, uh, if 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 you if their PCP doesn't tell them to do it, they're not going to do it. So it's even before f- clinicaltrials.gov and other before location three hours or at Northwestern or Rush. It's what is a clinical trial and why should I be interested in it? I and think that. And the safety aspect for the communities that have been impacted historically. Yeah, there's a book um, I just finished called Medical Apartheid. It's, it's the dark history, just, I think it's like the medical apartheid. It's, um, it's the history of experimentation on black Americans from colonial times to the present. And it speaks to just that, the, the, that issue that Nia just brought up. So I think, you know, what is a clinical trial, how to find it, and who tells me about it is going to determine whether I'm going to be interested in going or not. So there's a lot of layers within. So although Jasmine, you said earlier, we've come a long way. And yes, we have for certain communities. I know I can speak for in general mm-hmm. mine, it, it hasn't come that long of a way. No, and so, there's certainly more work to be done. And, and absolutely. Holly, I know you, you've done a lot of work recently. Do you want to share a little bit about? Yeah. So yeah, I, there's, there's been so many, so many great points and I'll just, I'll just kind of echo um, a lot of those. Um, But we've, we have seen, you know, so much historical uh, racial injustices and racism and those things have been passed down. And so they, they just kind of have this, this automatic, you know, people have this automatic turnoff to participating in clinical trials. But I think the, the research community isn't doing a good enough job to be able to translate the information well enough. So I think a lot of the research materials, they're, it's, it's confusing and they're, they're, things are lengthy um, and unclear and they're using a lot of clinical, you know, jargon and things that like people like, a lot of people just don't, just don't understand. So, and if you don't have someone actually like sitting down with you and explaining it, then, you know, people are, going to be kind of, you know, turned off to it. Um, I think one of one of the things that um, that came up in our recent study was um, a lack of a lack of peer or family support. Um, And I think this this speaks to um, what Naya was saying also about just, you know, like where where the where the clinical trial is happening. So like if it's if it's a long drive, one of our one of our patients has to drive for four hours. But if she didn't have her her husband with her, you know, I don't think she'd be able to participate. So, I mean, having having a lot of peer and family support, um, you know, just either just there with you in the room or helping with transportation or, you know, helping to explain things or sign things or fill out things. Um, I think that's that's an important point too. Absolutely. I think there's a two really important points, you know, access to information that's meaningful and, and you know, and, and it's easy enough to understand so that everyone can. And then also access to that information, but access physically too to the location of the study or, or where the research is being conducted. So in line with some of the comments that were made, um, most of the therapeutic um, clinical trials occur in big academic centers, which mm-hmm. means that they're located in major cities. Um, and if um, you never got referred to the major medical centers because um, you live far away from them, um, your local physicians may not be aware of any of these um, trials and would not be able to um, connect you with those um, trials. Uh, so this is always um, an issue that, uh, well, if um, you're not um, a patient in a big university center, you have um, far less um, options available to you. Um, the other um, uh, comment that was made just now is um, having family members to um, bounce some ideas off, um, should I really be involved in it? Um, help me sort of um, read through the whole thing. And we've always lamented that um, over the years, the consent form keeps getting longer and longer because of all these regulatory requirements. Okay, we need to add another um, paragraph on this. We need to add another paragraph on that. 
and as you read student consent form, it's almost like if you don't have a PhD, and even if you have a PhD, but not in this particular area, there's no way that you can really understand a consent form. I liken it to me signing the mortgage agreement. I really don't understand the legal language, but I need the mortgage, so I just sign it. Um, and you feel like, I mean, there's no way that your patients can understand because we keep adding stuff. And one of the things that I experienced during the early months of um, COVID was everyone was so fearful. When you offer COVID treatment trial, they want to participate, but they were also very scared because they were dying. And they had no family member around because visitors were not allowed. And it was so difficult. How do you explain um, this life and death um, treatment trial? to someone who's gasping for breath with no family member around. So we had all these um, three-way, five-way communication with um, phones and all that in order to give them a chance to talk to someone. Mm -hmm. um, and um, it, is, it is difficult because if someone else, even if your partner doesn't completely understand, but just being able to bounce it off is so helpful. Yeah. And I think you bring up a good point, you know, that there's still, even if you're able to communicate to someone else or a loved one, you know, you're about the clinical trial you're thinking about, you need to be able to understand it first. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to explain it to others. So I think, you know, people's comments about putting things in plain language or, or you know, things that you can be easily shared with others, um, really critical. I want to um, ask, you know, as we kind of shift gears, I, you know, we talked a lot about some of the barriers, but how else, you know, in your opinion, should um, clinical research we raise awareness about? I know, um, you know, we, a few of you have learned about clinical trial opportunities just by word of mouth. And I'm wondering, you know, in your opinion, what are some other avenues or, you know, do you think that's the best way to learn about research outside of your doctor? I've always thought in the community is going to be the best. Um, FQHC's model, I don't know who's familiar with the FQHC model, um, but it's, it's very much a community-based model throughout the country. It's like a network of small community agencies throughout the whole country. And um, I think there's 16,000 of them throughout the country, but they're very well connected. I think it has to start at the community level Otherwise, we're never going to get the representation that's needed for the clinical trials. I'm glad the FDA, the NIH have um, asked for this type of diversity in the clinical trials and have wanted reporters to report what you're doing to try to get diversity into your clinical trials, but it's still not there. So I think starting in the community is gonna be very important. FQHCs or other smaller community type agencies would be a starting point, like an actual physical starting point to say, how can we educate these agencies to um, educate on clinical trials, what they are, right? And then finding them. Yeah, and making sure that that all that physicians, I guess, as part of continuing education, are making sure that you know they're encouraging people to, to participate because sometimes you know you, you get an older doctor and they're like this is not that this no this does not apply to my patient population well how do you know if you don't ask them if they're interested mm -hmm. um so just you know that sort of reminder just because they they might not seem interested ask the question anyway um you never know how people are going to feel that day <laughs> mm -hmm. very good point mm -hmm. Just to go off a couple of those points, I uh, so I'm, I'm, I mentioned in when I um, introduced myself that my team uh, worked with the POL model from the CDC, the public opinion leader model. So that gets into that very community level work where we 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 trained um, groups of individuals from different zip codes in the Chicago area about clinical trials, barriers, facilitators, what participation means, how to read a consent document. And then they're they're now going out into their community and having uh, pointed meetings with with people, whether it's virtual or in person, and um, passing out some information cards and talking to people about participation in clinical trials. That's so that's getting at to that that community level, and then eventually that would be scaled up to a, a national program. So, but this is this is where it starts. Well, I know the people I tried to talk to, it was as though I was talking to a, a brick wall. They had <laughs> no interest. They heard sure. clinical trials. And then I tried like, because there are a lot of singers I know, and they're all heavy. They, they all have the same condition. And I started 
because I really thought it was important, you know, and um, so I said, well, you get the vaccine. <laughs> I thought that would work, but I had to say, but it was, it's a clinical trial and they had no, they were just like, oh, they're experimenting. I'm like, no, they're not experimenting on you. So there's a lot of fear and people yeah. kind of look at it as why do I need this? Mm -hmm. You know, someone else can do it, you know? I mean, sure. A lot of great suggestions, though, and I think the idea about starting at a community level and, and making information available, starting with education, and just, you know, uh, to your point, asking the questions is so important, you know, just at least having those conversations. Um, I want to I wanna also ask, I know we talked um, a little bit about access, and I'm just curious um, if anyone during the course of their clinical trial participation, um, if you ever experienced a, a virtual visit or, um, you know, one where you didn't have to maybe go physically in person, but you were able to speak to a study doctor or a nurse involved with the research um, to ask questions or perhaps have, you know, any sort of assessments done? That was an option in the trial that I was in, but the actual facility is so close to my house, mm -hmm. though all the people in my band and all the black people I talked to, it was on the north side of Chicago, close to, close to the lake, big facility, a beautiful place. Everyone's west side or south side. I was gonna bring that up earlier, but when someone mentioned four hours, I was like, it's not four hours, it's more like 40 minutes, but no, you know, um, but that was an option, but it was no issue for me to get there. Yeah. But, you know, maybe, if people, you know, if they got, if they moved past their fear, that would have, that would help, I think. Sure, absolutely. And I think, you know, like, um, like we said, you know, even if it's, you know, not a, a super far away, it's still, you know, logistics and people may not have flexible schedules. So it's really important. Yeah. Yeah, they were offering rides too. They said, we will come pick you up and bring yeah. you. And they still said no. Yeah because of the, this fear. Yeah. I mean, it was real. I was, I was really taken aback by it. You know, Still a lot of work to be done for sure. Um, I think, did you have a comment? I have to say, I think virtual is definitely an option, but it's, it's not the same. You know, I think there's things that happen in clinical trials that just virtually, um, they were not going to get what they need. Maybe you can go to a clinic close or hospital and send in your blood work or you know, go somewhere else and get that x-ray, whatnot, but it's it's not the same. But it definitely is, I think, something that, at least in our clinical trial, we had to learn quickly. We had a visit, a couple of visits to the NIH that had to be canceled through the pandemic. So we did what we could virtually, but I think, and I think it's not, the NIH very modern, lots, you know, the latest and greatest, right? But it's still government. So it's still like, like this, half a step or full step behind the rest of the world when or the rest of, of uh, you know of, of access the, when it comes to technology and approvals and how does virtual consent approvals work and you know there was a lot that I think they're learning now I think it'll get better moving forward and yeah. I think you're, I think you're going to see a lot more clinical trials um, be able to do it in that way virtually and go to this you know, go to Northwestern and get this blood work and then, you know, send it to us, things like that for, for different things. But I still feel like um, there, for clinical trials, there's there's going to be barriers to get over. But the virtual part, I think the world, as the world, you know, learns from COVID, it's the virtual is not is not going away. If anything, it's just going to get stronger, better, faster and uh, more important. Yeah. I think you brought up a good point. Maybe options are best or a hybrid approach of doing both might be, might be mm -hmm. a way forward. Mm -hmm. um, so one of our concerns with um, converting to virtual is, is a double-edged sword. Um, on the one hand, you make um, clinical trials um, more accessible. On the other hand, it requires that you have the technology and know-how. Um, and so that can also disadvantage um, the people that you really want to improve access. Right. Right. Now, there's a lot of a lot of really important considerations to kind of, you know, to really help us move the needle when we're talking about diversity um, in clinical trials. I wanted to believe it or not, we're, we're um, you know, coming up to our last question. And I want to make sure that everyone has a chance to chime in. You know, if if you knew someone that was considering participation in a clinical trial, what sort of words of wisdom would you would you give to them, or, or what what would you tell them is, is most important to think about or to consider? And I'd love to get you know people's feedback. 
I guess I'll start. Um, <laughs> sure. I think the most important thing is to make sure that you're doing it for your right reason. And whatever that is for you as the individual participant, I can't tell you what that is. Nobody can tell you what that is. But if that reason feels right for you, then absolutely go for it. Um, the great thing about clinical trials is you can stop at any point in time. You can say, no, I no longer wish to participate. I'm done. And nobody's going to, to say anything other than thank you so much for your participation so far. And, and that is the end of that. You always have the option to say no. Um, so that's, that's what, that, those would be my words of wisdom, you know, great point. to lose other than you know, a little bit of time. Um, maybe Holly, do you want to share? Wisdom? Yeah, I think um, not being afraid to ask questions of the research team, um, the PIs, the study coordinators, really anybody that's involved in the clinical trial, they might be talking with you about it, asking if you want to participate. Um, I think I think maybe sometimes people are afraid to ask questions. They're, they're afraid that, you know, they maybe they don't sound smart enough to, you know, talk about something technical. I mean, who who knows? I think that they just might be Maybe they don't understand the research materials. And so like uh, Dr. Locke was saying, she doesn't really understand the mortgage document, but she just signs it. So, you know, I don't, that's, you know, and that's, those are really the wrong reasons and the wrong way that we want to go about research. So I think people should just be not afraid to just ask the simplest questions, ask as many questions as you feel you need to, to feel comfortable. Well said. Anyone else? Uh, Dr. Locke? Yeah. Um so I agree that um, you should feel comfortable asking questions until you feel that you have a good understanding. You might not understand every little minor detail, but at least the major things um, you know. What's the potential benefit? What's the potential risk? What exactly are they asking me to do? Which is over and above my standard of care. Um, and oftentimes, because there's so much information, um, you might have to go back again and do not feel that the time of consent is the only time that you can ask questions because I mean, when you're given a 15 page document, who can completely digest it? <sighs> right. Well, we, we try to always make sure that the patients get a copy ahead of time before they come in, before mm -hmm. we discuss. And we try to keep on telling them if questions come up later on, feel free to bring them up, even though you've already consented. You can still ask for clarifications. Yeah, well said. I would just add, um, echo all your points, I think um, duly noted. I would just add that you are more in control than the researchers would have you think that you are. I think that's a, um, a misnomer. You know, there's are very specific outlines of clinical trials, you know, um, timelines and such. But you, as somebody else mentioned, you're in the driver's seat. If there's something that you have a question about, um, you have the right to ask and step away if it's not something you feel comfortable with. I've had to do that many times, you know, when, you know, you go into the NIH and you're getting blood work and, you know, your daughter's two and there's 12 vials. You know, somewhere along the line, I'm, I consented, <laughs> as Anna said, that, you know, you sign that they can take blood work for other things. But, you know, my daughter's two, how many do you need? Well, what are the rest? What are they for? Not today, you know? <laughs> so you could take four, you can't take 12 vials of blood. So you're more in control than what researchers, you know, they would sure. think that you are. So mm -hmm. I think that's the one thing. And to ask questions is duly noted. And to, uh, the one thing I tell families, um, we started a patient organization for my daughter's um, she has an auto-inflammatory condition called NOMID, very rare. And we started a patient organization and we always tell our families, you know, keep, now it's the phone. When I first started, it's like, have a notebook, write down all your questions, write down who you asked them to, what nurse said what, anything you have doubt about, because if it's not in writing, it never happened. So any questions that you have, just write it out. So if you remember too, and, and look back and, and recall. Mm -hmm. okay. I've, also, I've also asked, and not all clinicians feel strongly, uh, you know, when we do debriefs at some of the clinical trials towards the end of the week, we're there, we're doing all these studies. Yeah. I've asked to record the, the last debrief of the clinical trial when they're 
kind of reporting back what they found, what they saw, what changed, mm -hmm. what up. Because I'm like, as a mom, I'm just like, you got to sit back. There's a lot of information. So I have uh -huh. asked if I can record when they're explaining something to me so I can refer back to it or explain it to her primary care here at Elmhurst right. Hospital or Northwestern, mm -hmm. wherever she's at, has her appointment. So. When, um, and Lynn, yeah, do you want to share? Well, I, uh, my feeling, I mean, it's not clinical and I don't know, I've, I guess I feel like my, the trial I went through was really kind of easy peasy. <laughs> you know, there was no issues. What motivated me was just, I made the connection of, of, it, of it being a historic thing and being part of an answer, part of a, of, of a um, conclusion, part of a fix, you know? And um, I don't know, just thinking of all the, all the treatments and medications that were created from this, this was the, you know, the proof in the pudding or whatever, that was, that was a strong motivation for me. You know, okay. I, I also trusted the facility maybe because I was naive. I don't know, <laughs> but um, I, you know, I trusted um, the place because yeah. a dear friend was connected with it, but um, I just thought, well, I have an opportunity here. I mean, there have been trials that I am affected by like arthritis trials because I have really bad osteoarthritis. But um, every time I tried to get in one, my um, my BMI was too high and I wasn't allowed to do it. I was too fat to do an arthritis um, study. And I was like, well, I would have gotten something out of, there was some injection that they were testing. And I thought, oh, me, me. And they're like, no, you're too fat. And I thought, well, you know, <laughs> I was it's like, like well, there are people. What, what resonated sorry? with you was the, the, you know, the historic, you know, being able to really contribute. I think that's wonderful. Yeah, that was, you know, and I, like I said, it wasn't, it wasn't, it didn't sound like some of the tests that I'm hearing described, like the having your child, having all this blood drawn. I mean, I had some blood draws, but like at the most at a time was three. So very important but, though, you know, you, you definitely helped contribute, which is, which is wonderful. Yeah, I felt it was like, almost like my duty or, and I thought, oh, it's part of history. I mean, you know, a pandemic once a, once a century or whatever. And I just yeah. thought it's important to be part of it. And because yeah. my own culture and people were so um, harshly, if well, not harshly affected, but I mean, well, yeah, I mean, we were affected so absolutely. much and I fit and for once being obese <laughs> was in my favor to get to get accepted but um I think yeah wonderful. I just thought it was historic and I thought it you know I wanted to do I wanted to do my part it sounds no, kind of you're, you're everyone you're right else target. sounds so into <laughs> so intellectual no, and you're right on target Lynn they they uh I was just reading the other day COVID 30 percent of cases when the actual population of African American is 14 percent so you did your part and that's what clinical mm -hmm. trials do yeah, so, and that's what I ever service. Yeah, I thought we ha I have to represent, you know. No, I think everyone everyone here plays such an important role and um I just appreciate everyone's time. I want to just be um really quick and ask Dr. Jane if you can. Uh, we've talked a lot about asking questions. If you're thinking about clinical trial participation, um always knowing that you can stop participating at any time, uh, making sure that you know, you're, you feel like you're doing this for the right reason and I'm just wondering if you have any words of wisdom or you know, um, something that's really important that you feel like people should consider if they're thinking about clinical trial participation. Absolutely. Well, often, you know, we will recruit patients for my own practice, for example. These are patients that I've known for, you know, many years. And so I'll tell people that, you know, there, there's so many reasons to think about participating in a trial. Part of it is obviously to help yourself, right? I mean, that's that's going to drive a, a lot of it, but it, it truly does help everyone who comes after you with with the disease, and you know it, that especially resonates a lot with our with our COVID patients. Um, you know, I, I think that you know feeling like they could you know be a part of bringing the pandemic to an end or getting us that much closer. Um, so I think there you know there's a little bit of altruism that's involved in a clinical trial, and so um, but that that resonates with, with a lot of our patients. Absolutely. And I, I just want to say um, thank you all for the role that you've played in clinical research and helping, you know, develop new new therapies, new medications for others. I think it's all just, you know, wonderful and it's so important. So thanks to all of you for, for that, but also for your time today. Um, it's been wonderful to be able to speak with you all. So thank you. Thank, thank you all. Thank you for having us. Thank you. This thank is great. You. Great work you guys are doing at Christmas. So thank you.
Thanks. Wonderful. Thank you again to all our speakers for volunteering their time. This has been highly informative and we really appreciate all that you do to improve public health. And thank you all to who submitted questions. Please be sure to visit our FAQ section linked below the Resource Center for more information. Now let's all take a minute to get our bodies moving and follow along with Anita Nike for a seated yoga stretch. Hello, and thanks so much for joining me today for a five minute chair yoga stretch. My name is Anita Nike, and I am formerly the Quality and Compliance Manager at Describe. Chair yoga is a really great way to get some uh, exercise into your day. Um, you know, on those days when you're stacked full of meetings or just really busy, can't find some time. This is just a really great five minute stretch so you can still sit in your chair just between meetings, whatever, um, but still find a way to be active in the day. So this class will not require really anything besides any kind of chair that you have. It can be an office chair, it can be a dining chair, it can be whatever is available to you. Um, and it also won't really require any kind of high level of mobility. So wherever you're at in your yoga practice, whether you've taken a lot of classes or you've never taken a class before, this class will be great for that. So first things first, why don't we start just sitting in our chair, just sit straight upright, drop your shoulders down from your ears. You just wanna make sure that you're looking forward and taking in deep breaths. So let's take in a few deep breaths together. Let's go in and out, in and out. Okay, so now let's get some stretches in. I like to begin my classes just by doing a brief shoulder stretch. So bring your shoulders up and drop them behind you. Bring your shoulders up and drop them behind you again. Now let's do one more in that direction. So bring them up and then drop them behind you. Great. So now let's start in the other direction. So bring your shoulders up and bring them in front of you. Bring your shoulders up and bring them in front of you. Bring your shoulders up one last time and bring them in front of you. All right, great. So now let's get a little bit started some more. So take your left hand, put it on your right knee, take your right hand and put it on the chair behind you and just stretch backwards. Again, this class does not require a lot of mobility if you do not want it. So just stretch as far as you feel comfortable and bring it back forwards. Now let's do the same thing on the other side. So take your right hand, put it on your left knee, take your left hand, put it on the back of your chair and stretch it out a little bit. So one thing I'll add is that yoga should never feel painful. If you feel a little bit uncomfortable, if you feel like you're getting a stretch, that's great. You just, you never want it to be painful. All right, so with that in mind, take your right foot Put it over your left knee. And again, all mobility levels are welcome. And just push down a little bit until you feel a stretch in your right hip. So that should feel really, really nice. Again, if it feels painful at all, back off. It's a chair yoga class. You can take it at any ease or level that you want it to. You just really wanna feel that stretch. That's great. This is a really great stretch, especially for those of us who may have been sitting uh, for a long time during the day. Awesome. Okay, bring your foot down. Now take your left foot, put it over your right knee. And if you feel some popping, as you might have heard with my knee, um, that's great. Just lean into it. That shouldn't be something that scares you off. All right, really nice. So feel that, again, that really great stretch in your in your left hip you should feel like you're flushing a lot of toxins out of your body. All right. Okay, so now bring your foot back to the ground and we'll close class with just a small, just stretch of your back. If you've taken a yoga class before, you might recognize this as just a seated version of a cat cow pose. So how we'll start this is just by arching our back forward. That's great. And then curving our back as we move backwards. So arching our back as we move forward and rounding our back as we move backward. 
One more time together. We'll arch our back as we move forward and we'll round our back as we move backwards. Now let's take one last deep breath together. Let's lift our shoulders up and back. That's great. So thank you so much again for joining me today. My name is Anita and I hope you enjoy the rest of this AWARE event. Thank you so much, Anita. Please take a moment to answer poll question number five, true or false. Only people who are sick can volunteer for a clinical trial. There will only be two more poll questions throughout the program, so make sure you are testing your knowledge and you'll be eligible to win some awesome raffle prizes. I would like to thank each of you for joining us at Aware for All Midwest. We hope this is just the start of the conversation. There are a number of resources for you to refer to and continue your learning, starting with the handbook, as well as our informational exhibit center where you can explore booths from local organizations. You can access the informational exhibit by clicking on the banner images or by clicking on the link in the resource list. All of our event materials can be found at awareforall.org. They can serve as a guide with information about clinical trials here in the Midwest, as well as information about clinical research participation. The sixth poll question is now up on your screen. How likely are you to tell your friends or family about some of the things you learned today? We truly hope you'll share your key takeaways. And now for the final poll question, what brought you to the AWARE webinar today? You can select all answers that apply. Thank you to everyone who has answered the poll questions. You are now eligible to win one of several wonderful prizes. Don't forget to also look for the scavenger hunt kiosks in the IEC for the chance to win more goodies. We'll be contacting our winners directly via email and on social media, so be sure to follow us on all social platforms. We also have a brief survey which can be found by clicking the survey button on the bottom of your screen. We'd really appreciate it if you could share your feedback with us as we continue to enhance this virtual version of the Aware for All program. Thank you to the medical heroes in attendance today. Without your gift of participation, we would not be able to conduct new research to discover new cures and treatments. Thank you all again for joining us this evening. We'll keep the event page open for a few more moments before closing out the webinar so that you can visit the informational exhibit center, take our survey or download the event handbook. We encourage you to visit awareforall.org to access the information exhibit center and other resources whenever you'd like. We hope to connect with you at a future Aware for All event. Have a great evening, everyone.